So what I want to do today is tell you a story. And I hope it's uh, a story that will spark some conversation because we, I think we'll have enough time for that. Um, and it's a story that I really haven't told anyone before. So I, I hope you'll be patient with me and, and uh, uh, accept this in the, in the spirit in which I intend it. Because it really is kind of a work in progress in terms of not just my thoughts about what's happening in Silicon, Silicon Valley, but quite literally is about my life and the choices that I'm making right now. Having spent, and you're kind to just say more than, but it's 30 years covering technology and now looking at what am I going to do with that uh, in the last part of my career. So let me start my story at the beginning. My father was the pastor of the big Methodist church in the corner of a small town in western Pennsylvania. And there weren't Beyond the golden rule, there weren't a lot of rules in our house except for this one. That unless you thought you were going to personally meet God, you had to be in church on Sunday. And church on Sunday wasn't just you know, the, the church service. It started with Sunday school, and then we'd go on to the 11 o'clock service, and then there was social hour. And then after that, when, when I hit 16 and have a driving license, church extended to driving all the little old ladies home from church. So it was a full, quite a full day's activity. And it turns out that sun, church in our family wasn't even a Sunday morning one and done kind of thing. Right? It was church suppers on Sunday night, and youth group meetings, and retreats, and summer camp, and Bible studies. And during Latin Advent, it was Wednesday morning pancake breakfast. And or I think the only conversions that really happened there were the Shipley kids convincing middle-aged parishioners that peanut butter on pancakes was really awesome. <laughs> so it was a childhood that was spent growing up in church basements, and that taught me a lot about religion. It taught me a lot about the power of communities, the support that you get from communities. It talked about the powers that we give and we take from one another and our best intentions and sometimes actually our worst manipulations. So it was a bit of a surprise to me and you know sometimes I don't really know what I think until I say it. And I was having a conversation about Silicon Valley where I've lived for the last 20 years and someone said, well you know Silicon Valley is an ecosystem. And I said, no it's not, it's a religion. And I was kind of shocked by that revelation. And uh, I really had to stop and think about it, and that's really what this talk is about, really understanding how powerful that re revelation has been for me. Now, a lot of people are going to tell you that Silicon Valley is an ecosystem. And it's an interesting idea, and it's certainly one that I've posited a lot. Right? You get a compact environment, you put a lot of entrepreneurs and investors, you put in engineers and marketing people, you throw in uh, uh, lawyers and accountants and, and folks who know how to work with early stage companies, you add some mentors to the mix, and you get this thing that works. Right? And that's Silicon Valley, it's an ecosystem. And in fact, every year, thousands, literally thousands of, of economic development people and academics and, and other uh, politicians, they come to Silicon Valley to figure out how, e how Silicon Valley works. And they go and they, they talk to they go down Sand Hill Road and they talk to the investors and they go to the incubators and the accelerators and they talk to startups and, and they shake a bunch of hands and they go away thinking, okay, I think I've got it. And then they pour in literally $3 trillion a year. Economic development organizations, $3 trillion a year to try to recreate it. And so they, they create an investment fund or they, they build an incubator, an accelerator. They bring the, the rock stars of Silicon Valley to their organization. This is what I was criticizing somebody for yesterday, and here I'm doing it. And they bring those people into the community to, to kind of evangelize entrepreneurship, and yet they still don't have a thriving ecosystem. Right? Things might get a little bit better. You might start a few businesses. Often those businesses are magnetically drawn back to Silicon Valley, but you don't get these dynamic uh, systems. And I really started to wonder why that was, because right? they're doing all the right things. They have all the right ingredients. And what it occurred to me is that even though 
there's so much money being spent and so much good intention. What was missing, the thing that catalyzes Silicon Valley is an ethos. It's a set of values. And those values are critical to the functioning of Silicon Valley. And it's those, those values that I think define how it works. Now, if you talk to a lot of people in Silicon Valley, and there were some talks this morning, I think, that suggested this, they'll tell you that, that Silicon Valley works because it's the smartest people. It's the best engineers. We've got the experienced investors. We have you know, just the best and the brightest and the most of everything. So it's just fabulous and you should come to see us. You should just bring your business to Silicon Valley. And I think that's not the right answer. Um, and yet, it does explain a lot. And again, the, it's because Silicon Valley really is a value system. Now, when someone tells you that Silicon Valley is the best and the brightest, they're evangelizing, they're preaching. Right? They, they might as well you know, call out for an amen. Because that's how religions work. It's important for people who are in the valley, who are embracing an eco or a, a value system, to want to proselytize it, because that's how they get value themselves. Right? And so we talk about the kinds of companies you should build, and the, the way you should build your company, and the right way to do things, and that's all about we know, and we need to reinforce for ourselves the right way of our values, the, the legitimacy of them. Now, this may sound like a little bit of a wobbly uh, metaphor that I'm making, so I really went through this to think about whether I was right. Was this, did this have some legs? And just think about it. Religions have books. Every great religion has its scripture. So what do we have? Whether it's crossing the chasm of the 80s, or how's this for a religious title? The four epif uh, uh, epiphanies, or the four steps of the, what is it? Steps of the epiphany, thank you. Um, you know, and all the other books that come behind it that tell you how to be a true believer, a true entrepreneur. We've got books. Religions have prophets and missionaries and, and disciples. And Silicon Valley, you just have to look at the, the speaker list here. And you've basically had a chance to hear from many of those people who are coming from Silicon Valley and telling you the one right true way to start up success. Religions have churches and places of worship, meeting houses. We have accelerators and co-working spaces and incubators in Silicon Valley. Religions have sin and forgiveness and redemption. And what do entrepreneurs have? Failure and lessons learned and serial entrepreneurship. And where I grew up, religion absolutely had church suppers. And we get meetups in Silicon Valley. The parallels are really, really incredible. But the most important one is that every religion has a value system. And Silicon Valley has a value system uh, that is unique to itself. And when I realized that, that's when I started to get uncomfortable. And now I'll dial back to my teenage self. I don't know about you, but those were not my best years. And they weren't my best years. I didn't understand at the time, in large part because I was really searching for my values, but living in a value system that told me that I had to live in a certain way. And even as the preacher's kid, going off to, to camp meetings and retreats, when all the kids around me were having these incredible religious experiences, I was saying, if God, why, why not me? And I'd, I'd end up you know, crawling back into my sleeping bag at night thinking, well, I guess I'm going to hell. Right? Something was wrong with the way I was living that I couldn't have those experiences. And so over time, as I realized I was not believing what everyone else was around, around me believing, I began to separate from that church upbringing. And, and I want to say that I don't have a strong moral compass. I think I do. I think I have a guiding set of principles and a spirituality that's important to me, but it's just not the one that I grew up in and the one that created a painful discomfort to me. So I got to where I got to from a different path. 
And I think that sense of discomfort came back into my life a few years ago. I was out of alignment with my community then, and what I realize now is that I've become 25 years on or so out of alignment with my Silicon Valley community. So in the fall of, of 2011, I wrote a piece after hearing about the thousandth pitch for the Airbnb of something you really don't need. And in this case, it was the Airbnb for the extra space in your luggage. <laughs> I, I am, that is not a joke. Right? What is wrong with that business plan? Right? I, I think they wanted to call it Air Mule, but I'm not, I'm not sure. So I listened, I, I, listened, I read this plan. I was, it was, I'll tell you, it was, for, it was doing, reviewing the startups for the LeWeb competition. And I just kind of threw my hands back. I said, what are these people thinking? I mean, at a time when it was theoretically easier to be an entrepreneur than ever before, easier to start a company, the, low, the bar was so low, this, this was what people were deciding to do, but there was a reason for it. Right? The value system of Silicon Valley had become about the quick flip. Low bar, get in, grab a bunch of users, don't ask them for much, because right? you know, you know, if you have to actually pay for this crap, people aren't going to buy it. But get them all in there and then quickly sell yourself to a Facebook or a Twitter or whomever else happens to have a lot of cash that they're sitting on. Some way for them to acquire your engineers, most likely. And I wrote this piece and I said, listen, it is hard work. Whether you are making the Airbnb for the extra space in your luggage, or an application to help you find the freshest cupcakes in Silicon Valley, or something else that is equally as trivial, it's still gonna be hard work. And the likelihood, and as, as Jenna said yesterday, was it 92, three, four percent of companies fail. So the likelihood is you're not gonna be successful because you're just going after something for this purpose of making money. And what you've actually done is turn, or what has actually happened, I believe, is that Silicon Valley has turned into a commodities trading place. And the commodity are startups and engineers, even engineers more than their ideas, and even perhaps their customers, but likely just the engineers. And, and I was trying to, to, to really combat that. I was pushing against that. If you're gonna work this hard, make it matter. Do something important. Do something that could put a dent in the universe. For God's sakes, this is hard work. And yet, the parade of startup pitches around things that were I felt rather trivial. And for the last three years, I've been you know, kind of I've the, the uh, counter uh, evangelist to this movement of every, anybody can just start a business, go do it. To say, go do the things that matter. Go do the things that can actually have an impact, all the while watching that that was not what was happening. And there was a physical discomfort for me. And, and the thing I don't really share, but I'll, I'll risk it here, is that I became very depressed. I was working in a company. I had built a company that was about, I'll stay right here, that was about supporting startups. And the companies that needed support really didn't need my support. Right? They weren't companies that I could connect to. And my business was, was not going in the place that I wanted, and I came to the conclusion that it was not going to get the lift that it needed, and I figured, you know, forget it. I am not going to spend the next 20 or 30 years of my life working with kids who want to be sold to Google. I mean, it's nice for them, but it's not going to help me any. It's not going to help me put a dent in the universe. And so I stopped. I wound down my company at the end of 2012, and kind of realized I had to figure out what was going to happen next. And I got invited to go spend 30 days uh, with Unreasonable at Sea. And uh, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with the program called um, Semester at Sea, but it literally is a floating university. We had 900 kids who were taking a semester's class while at sea traveling around the world. And I joined that ship in South Africa and sailed for 30 days with those students and with um, 11 social entrepreneurs who had been using the trip as a way to market test some incredible things. Clean cook stoves, uh, hearing aids, solar powered hearing aids to enable poor children in Africa to actually have a hearing aid that worked. 
um, clean water systems that were based on, on um, very inexpensive environmental um, natural filtering, and on and on. And I thought, now these people, they're making it matter. This is what I want to do. And I got done, and I, I, I landed back in San Francisco, and there were more cupcake apps. Right? And so I decided I'm going to take a time out, and I spent the last uh, academic year in Missouri. Has anyone been to Missouri? Yeah, because I hadn't either until, until I, I got this fellowship at the University of Missouri to study the, the future of journalism. And the best thing about it, I mean, it was exciting, it was very nice to have this white space to think, but the best thing about it is that it took me outside of Silicon Valley. And I got to meet people who were doing really interesting things. And I got to meet people who were really clear on what their values were. And I may or may not have shared those Midwest values. I grew up in Pittsburgh, so I sort of understood them. But they were really clear on what they were doing, and they weren't trying to mimic something else. And in fact, in many cases, they were doing the harder work because they had harder obstacles. They didn't have the, the abundance of resources that, that the folks in Silicon Valley did. So I, I came back out of that and I realized that I had to go back now to Silicon Valley. I went back, in, uh, back home in May. And, and that's when I had this conversation, this conversation about an ecosystem. And I was, Again, I had this tension, and I told you, I was, I, I'd closed my business. I was trying to figure out what to do next. I'm 52 years old. That is not the best time in your life to figure out what you want to do next, especially in a, in a community that values youth. And you know, all the issues, health, happiness, all this stuff was crushing down on me. And I had this revelation. It's a religion. Silicon Valley is a, re a religion. It's a way of life. Now, I make no judgment about that religion, just as I make no judgment about any uh, heaven, God-based religion that anyone wants to choose. You find your path, you take it. If it works for you, God bless you, go in peace. Right? But what happened to me is that I realized that Silicon Valley didn't work for me anymore. And I would posit that that doesn't work for a lot of people, both in Silicon Valley, in that geography, but also who are playing along in the game. The game that says you got to go chase the traction, grab the, 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 the dollars, bring your customers, you know, something that looks like customers and activity and froth together, and then flip it as fast as you can before anyone figures out that there's nothing there. Right? Now, not all businesses are that way, right? but there's a lot of that going on. But the moment I realized that, things clicked for me. And I felt better, because I realized I don't have to play that game. I don't have to be that entrepreneur. I don't have to be that mentor. I don't have to be that coach. And that was so liberating for me. Now, why am I telling you this at this festival, which is about, in many ways, emulating some of the practices of Silicon Valley and evangelizing startupness around the world? Well, what I realized is that that alignment that who you are and what you do is so important. And when you're trying as hard as you can to push yourself over here to be something you aren't, to pursue a kind of business that doesn't fit who you are, to, to work so hard on something you really don't care about, you are not in alignment. And I'm going to make a, a bet, and I'm going to have to go do the research, or if I'm lucky, Jenna will do the research for me, because she's a much better researcher. But I'm going to bet that of the 90 plus percent of companies that fail, the vast majority of them are out of alignment. They're chasing somebody else's dream about what it means to be a startup, about what kind of business you should be in, about where to build your business, about how to build your business, about the people with whom you're going to build your business. And so what I want to share with you today is just that, find your values, find your compass. Figure out what you want to work on. And it may be that what you want to do is build something quick and sell it and be rich. That's fine. But know that that's what you're doing. And know that that's really, really, really hard. 
and it's even more rare. But that's okay. If that's what you want, go for it. And if you want to do something else, build tough technology or, or, or put wells in, in Africa or help kids get educated or figure out the secret of why passwords suck, go do that. Right? Because you're going to work really hard and you need to be passionate about it. And you're going to work, have to work with people that you also connect with. Right? Many of us, kind of, I've built a number of companies, you have investors or you pitch to investors and they say, you know, I really think you should go over here. Or I think you should go over there. And you know you found the right investor when you click, when you're all going in the same direction, when you have alignment. So if there's anything I want to leave you with, and then hopefully we can have a conversation, and you can all tell me why I'm full of it, uh, is that I want you to find out who you are, what kind of company you want to build, or what kind of company you want to mentor, or what kind of company you want to invest in, who you want to be as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as a mentor, and get yourself aligned. Because when you find that alignment, you're going to be happier, you're going to be healthier, and you're going to be a hell of a lot more successful. And then at the end of the day, I think that's how we all make it matter. So that's the story I want to tell you. That's the message I want to leave you with. I've also left a lot of time on the uh, clock, or the calendar perhaps. It may feel like days to you. Um, and I would love to have a conversation, starting with the handsome man in the front row. Is there a microphone? Because I don't think we can have a conversation in the room with the side. No? Yeah. I think we can bring one up here for us. So, Chris, first, thank you for being so willing to be vulnerable in front of this group and to share your truth. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thanks for that. Thank you. I had the privilege of first meeting you in 1998 at the peak of the notorious tech bubble, where I brought a, t a company on stage at Demo, mm -hmm. and the world has evolved. Um, and, and I, I guess I... would say devolved. Yeah, yeah, devolved. So one, Silicon Valley ebbs and flows, and, and like most extraordinary institutions, it's, it's become a victim of its own success. There's no doubt, right? Um, and I've led this double life for the last 25 years as both a startup founder and a professor. And what I'm seeing in this generation of students that are coming through master's programs today is probably the most socially conscious group I've seen in my 25 year teaching career. And more often than not, they care deeply about the social impact of their venture as much as they do about the financial success of their venture. And I'm not saying that you're gonna see that necessarily in Silicon Valley, but just up north in San Francisco, it's becoming this incredible center of gravity for social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And although I teach in many master's programs, the one I enjoy the most are these young kids that want to make a dent in the universe. Um, and they are following their own values. But it's not easy, right? And then you see a show like Silicon Valley on HBO, which is hugely entertaining, but quite a remarkable commentary on the state of that ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I find or, uh, Ecosystems like Montreal or you know, places off the beaten path far more pure and far more sort of adhering to the ethos of what Silicon Valley stood for in the 1980s and 1990s. And, and I love your message, which is follow your own star. Don't, pretend, don't think you have to follow the, the Silicon Valley model because more often than not, it's gonna lead to, it's gonna lead to lack of satisfaction and failure. So, well, great I think, discussion. I think that it, thank you. I think that is the Silicon Valley model, right? The, the, the expectation that, that nine of ten companies is going to fail, those are not great odds. Right? You're not even starting on a, on a balanced field. Right? And, and so, I do think that this is, whether it's evolved or devolved, it has narrowed into a, a very particular way of doing business. And if you say, well, I want to do a business, was, a gentleman here, Jonas, uh, his company's called Jonas. Um, he sells custom designer umbrellas. Um, they're really very attractive, and each one of them connects to a story about building a well in, to, to provide clean water in Rwanda. Okay? It's 
cool business. He's, he's incorporated as a B company, B corporation. Yeah. My guess is he would never be able to do that in Silicon Valley because someone would say to him, you know what? That's a lifestyle business. Yeah. Uh, and all the while, by the way, uh, overlooking the fact that most venture investors are in a lifestyle business of their own. Um, right? and, and, so, and, and when someone says that's a lifestyle business, it's not just, you know what, that's a business that doesn't work for me as an investor because my job as an investor is to return excessive capital to my investors. It's this pejorative, that's a nice lifestyle business. You go along, you little nice boy, you. Right. Or I'm going to be a social entrepreneur. Oh, those are different. Those are social entrepreneurs. They're not real entrepreneurs. I'd say it's a hell of a lot harder to build wells in Rwanda than it is to sell an app to put extra space in your luggage. Yeah, hi. And, and, and something I've been spending the last few years telling different founders and entrepreneurs is that it's not just that the VCs are in a business of, um, you know, rolling the dice, uh, as you say, uh, to, to make an amount of money, but they're also in a very structured business. And, and you have to be prepared to fit into that structure if you want to play that game. And this is what, uh, you know, over and over again, every year I find entrepreneurs and, and founders who are unprepared for that, they, they don't understand that, they're, they're confused and upset when confronted with that reality. Mm -hmm. But you know, the fact is is that uh, VCs are, are very, very specialized. They're either duck hunters or they, they might be grouse hunters, or, but you could be the most beautiful deer in the world and they will not shoot you because you won't fit into their sausage machine. <laughs> well, and, and I don't want this to be a piling on of you know, investors. Investors aren't bad people, they're just doing the job that they have. They sh it's often shrouded in this something else, right? I'm a company builder, I'm, you know, if, if an investor put on his, or usually his, but sometimes her website, I'm in the business of making a lot of money for already really rich, rich old white guys. You would not be particularly attracted to that business. But we, we put a patina around it, right? And so I'm in the business of building companies, of sparking innovation. That sounds a whole lot better. And, and that's, again, being a, an investor, that's cool. That's fine. That's great. And that has fueled so many fantastic companies. So I take nothing away from it. What I, I think is worrisome is when, we've, we don't, when we miss sight of what the values are, what the mission is, what the alignment is, and we believe that we have to align to a story that doesn't fit for us. And when we do that, as individuals, we become less of who we can be. And I believe when you are acting in a way that is less, a, a reduction of who you are, you can't build the best business you possibly can. It's, it's a very simple thesis. Hello. Uh, do you think that VCs are finding this alignment that you found as well? Because I've seen some newer funds that are focusing on social innovation. Yeah, I, I think that there's lots of opportunity. I mean, the nice thing about sort of, I think, putting some sunshine and transparency on, on what's happening around the world around entrepreneurship is it allows people to find new ways. Just like the Methodist Church in Scott, Scottsdale, Pennsylvania, where I grew up, 2,600 people. Want to guess how many churches were in Scottsdale, Pennsylvania? 28. Because we had, you know, there were two Methodist churches because when the EUBs and the Methodists joined, we couldn't cooperate. We had to have our two churches. But there, you know, there were three Catholic churches, four Baptist churches, a couple of Presbyterians, and a couple of offshoots that I don't even know what went on in there on Sunday morning. This, you know, we, we are, we find our tribes and we find our places. And I think the, the mistake of Silicon Valley's messaging today and, and Silicon Valley, not just in that space between San Jose and, and San Francisco, but Silicon Valley, the ethos, is that we try to say that there's only one true way to do it. And that, to me, is, is a definition of a cult, not a religion. It, we function more like a cult. And you know, you know the phrase people say, they drank the Kool-Aid? And that's somehow meant to mean, wow, I'm a true believer? You remember that the people that drank the Kool-Aid died, right? It, but people are drinking Kool-Aid and not knowing that that's you know sort of even where that metaphor comes from. Other comments, questions. You already come move to Montreal, or somewhere else. How many of you feel are in Silicon Valley now? Live in Silicon Valley, work in Silicon Valley. I'm just trying to figure out how many people I've offended here. <laughs> Do you think I'm far off? 
Please, I would, I would love it. Now, this is very interesting discussion. It's on the borderline. Hopefully, your message is well understood because I came to Silicon Valley from different country, okay? So I know both ways. But, um, I mean, um, at the end of the day, I mean, there are many values in Silicon Valley that all entrepreneurs should be interested to understand. And also, your story is very interesting. So I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. There's a Thanks very much, Chris, for, uh, for everything you said. And it really validates a lot of what I've thought and felt. And I've been in the Bay Area. And I moved back to Montreal, actually, to start my company here at a time when VCs said that hardware was not sexy. And then I came back here and almost time to write. Come to Silicon Valley, we're still where alive. hardware is sexy. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things I've struggled with a lot with the company that we have is we, we saw a vision for the world needs something. It's great. And then we got to a certain point where we realized that maybe we could do something that could create a lot of value for the planet, but was really hard to find a, a business model and a way to make it move forward. And, and most of the people that looked at us, and we went through an accelerator too, kind of shook their heads and didn't understand how we were gonna make it move forward. Um, and my daily struggle is really, there's a part of me that wants to just do it because I think this creates value and finally people are starting to use it and see that. But on the other side of, do I fit into the game of what I'm supposed to do to have a company that's gonna have a successful exit so I can be a serial entrepreneur and live that dream, which isn't really my dream. Then don't so, do it. Exactly, so that's, that's kind of the tough point. thing. And uh, I think it's really nice, you're not the first person to start talking about this, but I'm glad that it's, it's, it's bubbling up, that it's okay to be different, you know? It's okay to be. What we <laughs> well, I, you know, I, listen. I, I I grew up a preacher's kid, and I, I wasn't. I couldn't practice that religion. Um, I'm gay. I don't work in the. I don't fit into a straight world context. I am in Silicon Valley, and I'm not a Silicon Valley type entrepreneur. I've been out of alignment for a long time. <laughs> And I'm just very happy. Maybe that's it. I just feel so lifted that I suddenly figured out what was wrong, right? And it's not wrong with me. It's wrong with not being aware. And so if it, you might end up building a company, and the best thing that comes along is that you can exit that and make a happy life for yourself and your family. Maybe not. But you're going to be working. And a lot of people who are trying to exit and never do feel like they failed. So I think making sure you know why you're in the business why you want to, what ends you want to achieve, and then working toward those things, staying true to that alignment, that vision, those values, and, and trying to get those other voices, you know, quiet them. I think it's, it's very hard to do, um, but I think you'll be much more successful if you do. Well, uh, the, it's a nice, yeah, yeah. The, if it was you know, even a lifestyle business, I'd be happy, right? So when I, when I hear you talking, though, I, you're, you're talking from the perspective of already being in, in that machine. And I'm, I'm looking at it from the perspective of a lot of the people that I work with who are trying to get into it. And they're not trying to get into it because they want to adopt those values or because uh, they think that this is the one true way and they, they've drunk the Kool-Aid. They want to get into it because they have some kind of dream of a... Of a, of a uh, of a company that they want to found and start, and they know of no other way to get money. And, and so, you know, I see at least, you know, a lot of people that are sort of shoehorned into that and try and understand, okay, you know, what, what, what's, what shape peg do I have to be to fit into that hole? Not because those are my goals, not because I think that's how I want to live my life, but because I, can, I know of no other way and no one can suggest of any other way to me uh, to get the capital I need to, to, to move my company forward. Yeah, I, I understand that. I think that that comes from a um, perspective that says, have an idea, write it on a napkin, get funded, build the business. And, uh, and, and that, again, being hammered in again and again and again. Um, just in the last few months, I think that, that the tech industry lost a great leader, a gentleman named Pat McGovern. Uh, Pat McGovern founded IDG, so if you've ever read a magazine that had blank world after it, that's, that's Pat's legacy. He had a $5,000 loan from his family to start that company. It's a multi-billion dollar company and he never took outside investment. And, and I agree with, by the way, I agree with what you're saying and I suppose my point in raising the issue in the first place was one of the things that we can do to help guide people away from that, you know, an additional part of the dialogue 
is, is, is doing a good job of promoting those alternative routes to people. I, I absolutely think you're right, because in tr truth, the vast majority of startups will never raise outside money. You're not, sorry, you're all lifestyle businesses, I'm really sorry to say. You're not, you're not the kind of profile of an investment that it, a, let's say, a typical investor would like to see. You don't have that lift and exit and, and the me metrics that most investors are gonna look for. But you may have a great product that customers wanna buy or a service that you can, can sell or, you know, Kick, with Kickstarter and Indiegogo, we're seeing new ways of capitalizing businesses early. And I think we have to, to your point, talk about those as much as we talk about, and by the way, I'm, I'm doing the you know, bloody knuckle Sand Hill Road thing, because the other paths are really great alternatives. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your message. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of the gentleman up front uh, who's working in San Francisco, and I'm wondering, well, I have an MBA in sustainable business, so I'm coming at this from definitely the social entrepreneurship bent. And I'm thinking about the people who are coming into this ecosystem who want to enter it from a social entrepreneurship bent. Um, but unlike you, they're not um, coming through the system with lots of street cred and then sort of waking up. Um, you know, the Grateful Dead had a lot of um, Kool-Aid too that people didn't die from. Just <laughs> That's a good point. I will, and um, I like their Kool-Aid quite a bit. Particularly um, in, a, in a more vaporized form, but yeah. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, um, what's the what's the message, and how can we build a system around people who don't have the traditional Silicon Valley or whatever, you know, exit success, but who want to do good? Uh, that I mean, that's their intention from the beginning. Well, two two things. One thing. One, I do not think that there is a difference between a social entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. I think they're all entrepreneurs. Right? And I think that, you know, I make decisions every day very consciously about where I shop, who I do business with, it's about supporting entrepreneurs, right? So I care about local, I, I shop local, I do local, because I know in doing that I'm putting money in the pocket of entrepreneurs. We all, I think, if we embraced entrepreneurs from small business people on Main Street through to whatever Indiegogo campaign to the kind of uh, whether it's for-profit, not-for-profit, B Corp, funded, unfunded, if we were better conscious consumers and understood our impact, that would be valuable, and I'm getting the big hand raise. So I get 58 seconds to make this point, um, except for now I've forgotten it. Um, I think that would be one thing, right? If we just recognize that we're all entrepreneurs. I think the other thing to remember is there are a hell of a lot more of us who aren't venture-backed startup entrepreneurs. And we need to own our own vision and our own values and know that those are just as true as a pathway that's written about in all the books that are filling the library over in, uh, in Austin's tent over there. Um, I think that, that we tend to collect, the collective we has bought into the story and the path and the book and the evangelism as the one true right way. And, I'll, and what I'm suggesting is that there are many true right ways, and the one that's right for you is the one that's true for you. So um, thank you for letting me tell my story. Thanks for the good conversation. It's always great to be here.